Hebrews chapter 11. Hebrews chapter 11, we'll be looking at verses 8 and 9 this evening. Well, we'll get into 10 just a little bit, so we'll just go ahead and read all three of them together. And the title of the message this evening is The Sojourner's Rule of Life. The Sojourner's Rule of Life. The scripture says, by faith, Abraham, when he was called to go into a place which he should after receive for an inheritance, obeyed and went, and he went out not knowing whither he went. Listen, by faith, he sojourned in the land of promise, as in a strange country dwelling in tabernacles with Isaac and Jacob, the heirs with him of the same promise. For he looked for a city which hath foundations, whose builder and maker is God. Now in, these, in the previous verse here, in verse 8, we see the apostle lays out for us the faith of Abraham as an illustration of all true faith in Christ. The faith of Abraham is an illustration of all true faith. That by faith Abraham was called of God to go into a place that he should receive afterward for an inheritance. Now this calling of Abraham, we know this, it was not by merit. The calling of Abraham was not by the wisdom of Abraham. The calling of Abraham did not come because Abraham sought God. The calling of Abraham came by God seeking Abraham. It was God who called him. Matter of fact, Abraham was a pagan idolater. He was 75 years old, steeped in idolatrous ways. And yet the Lord called him, the word of God is very clear on this point, that no man will ever seek after God. The scriptures are plain. Romans chapter 3 is very clear. There is none righteous, no, not one. There is none that understandeth, there is none that seeketh after God. None. Abraham did not seek God. The depravity of man is so great. This is a point that must be stressed at every opportunity. The depravity of man is so great that let the gospel be preached with ever so much clarity. Let it be preached with ever so much plainness of speech. Let the proof be ever so infallible, irresistible proof. Let the argument be so ever sound as it may be. If we could call such men with zeal and love and plead with sinners, let the tears from our eyes flood this world in pleading with men. And I tell you, we do. I beseech you, I beseech you, be ye reconciled to Christ. But let it be ever so much pleading. But unless God calls the sinner to life, except God draw the sinner, except God call the sinner, that man will never come to Christ. Men today use many tricks to deceive men into coming. I heard one preacher say, well, you need to have a lot of uh, potluck dinners and you could draw a big crowd with potluck dinners. What are they trying to do with those dinners? They are trying to deceive men to come into the church and trick them into believing. You can't trick a man into believing. 
as much as you can trick a dead corpse into life. You can't do it. It's impossible. And friends, this is not something we make up. This is not something that we, uh, that we preach because of intellect. This is what Christ Himself preached. Go to John chapter 6. Our Lord, the, pre the Prince of Preachers, preached this. In verse 44 of John chapter 6, No man can come unto me. Plainer words were never spoken. No man can come unto me. Except, here's the exception, the Father which has sent me, draw him and I will raise him up at the last day. And listen, it is not only the Lord who said it, but the prophets that went before him. He says, As it is written in the prophets, and they shall all be taught of God. What is it to draw a sinner? It is to be taught of God. It is to be taught of God. Every man therefore that hath heard and learned of who? The Father. What does the Father teach? What does the Father do when He draws the sinner? He says this, He cometh unto me. What then is the evidence of the drawing? What is the evidence of the calling? What is the evidence of the teaching of God? It is that you believe on Christ. You believe. Our gospel is clear, it's as clear as... As day, Jesus said, I am the bread of life. I am the bread of life. I am the living bread. It came down from heaven. If any man eat this bread, he shall live forever. And the bread that I will give him is my flesh, and I will give, give it for the life of the world. No man can come. No man has the ability unless they're taught of God. And that's what happened to Abraham. When he was called, he was taught of God. He was drawn of God. And the result of calling is always this. Faith in Christ. That is always the result. It is not a call to decision. It is a call to life. It is a call to faith. All that God gave His Son shall come to Him. Of which Jesus declared that they should all, all of those that He gave should come to Him, that they would believe on Him, who by nature could not. But how? How shall they who by nature being depraved, who are unwilling and incapable, how shall they come to Christ? They are drawn of the Father. Taught of the Father, even as Abraham was, by divine call and revelation of God, by the sovereign, free, and grace of God alone, Abraham was called. Have you been called? This is a moment for reflection. Have you been called? The apostle plainly tells us then the means of how God calls sinners. The means by which God calls sinners is also plainly declared. It's plainly declared man's depraved and he will not come to God. He cannot come to God and nor will he seek God. It's plain. And it's plain that this, that only God calls and draws and teaches sinners. But how then does God call sinners? How then does God teach sinners? I tell you, through the preaching of the gospel. The preaching of the gospel. Go to Romans chapter 10. Romans chapter 10. Verse 13, beginning there. For whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. This is our gospel, isn't it? Whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. That's our gospel. Now what does that mean? 
who shall call upon the name of the Lord. Now it's not just any name, is it? You can't just call on any name. It must be the name of the Lord. They shall be saved. Not any name will do. Not any Jesus will do. You got that? Not any Jesus will do. Not any old Christ will do. But the Lord Jesus Christ as He is revealed in Holy Scripture, the one testified of by the prophets and the apostles who received their word from the Holy Spirit and were eyewitnesses, that is the only Jesus that we call on. That is the only Jesus that God teaches us to call on. Now there are many who call on the name of Jesus who is nothing like the Son of God. They call on the Jesus of their own imagination. The Christ of their parents. The Christ of their feelings. Well, I think Jesus... I don't care what you think Jesus is. And you know what? You shouldn't care what I think Jesus is. You should care who Jesus is according to the Word of God. And everything else must be set aside. Feelings, thoughts, parents, grandparents, whatever they said about Jesus, if it contradicts the Word of God, it is not Christ. This is who God reveals. The Christ of this book. Christ of this book. The only Jesus who can save sinners is the one is revealed in this book. And if our Jesus is not this Jesus, then our Jesus is not Christ. What does this book reveal about this name of the Lord? Whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. Who is, the, who is this Lord? Well, first of all, He is God manifest in the flesh. <laughs> you got that? God manifest in the flesh. I like this without controversy. You see that? See what Paul did? He put all debate aside immediately. You know, I love that story about the Unitarian, Mary, uh, Unitarian and the brother who's a Baptist preacher. And uh, they said, uh, he, he called his Baptist brother over. He was sick to preach for him. He said, you can't preach anything controversial. And you know the Unitarians didn't believe in the, the deity of Christ. So... Uh, he, he preached from that text in 1 Timothy 3.16 without controversy. It's without controversy. Great is the mystery of godliness. God was manifest in the flesh. So that's the Lord I'm talking about. That's the one that God calls us to. God manifest in the flesh. The Christ of Scripture, God sent to redeem, save, justify, sanctify, and obtain everlasting righteousness for all the elect. You got that? All the elect. God hath made him to be wisdom, righteousness, sanctification, and redemption for us. You see, this Christ that we believe on, that we are called to believe, is a representative Savior. A representative Savior. And we know this Christ is victorious in His work. Thou shalt call His name Jesus. You listen, before He did one thing as a man, before He was born into the world, you get this, the Scripture said He shall save His people from their sins. It was as good as done before it was even done. Our Christ that we worship is successful he said, it is finished by His one offering. He hath perfected forever them that are sanctified. And Christ is victorious, successful Savior who saved His people. And even now He has sent the Holy Spirit into the world to call them, to call them who are lost. And I tell you, not one of His elect will ever be lost. Not one of them will ever not come to Christ. They will all come to Him. 
All that the Father giveth me, says my Savior, all that the Father hath given me shall come to me. And him that cometh to me I will in no wise cast out. I am the good shepherd and know my sheep and am known of mine and the Father knoweth me. Even so know I the Father and I lay down my life. You listen. For the sheep. For the sheep. Not for everyone. For the sheep. Those that the Father hath given me. I lay down my life for them. And he said, many sheep. I, he said, I have sheep that are not of this fold. Does it not kind of make you smile that he was thinking of you? Specifically you. I have sheep not of this fold. Them I also must bring. I must bring them. And there shall be one fold and one shepherd. This, thus the gospel that we preach, the purpose that we preach this gospel is that God should bring in His sheep and they should believe and follow Him. But now then, what do you do with this? Because every one of you just heard me. Paul says, have they not all heard? Didn't you just all hear me? Every one of you just heard me. And I, I pray that my speech was plain, that it was simple so that everyone could understand what I said. I, I purposefully do this. I don't, I don't want to be intellectual. I want to be plain. Have you not all heard the gospel that I just preached to you? But I tell you this. Why is it that not all of you believed? Because not all of you were called. Not because you weren't smart enough to understand what I said. The only people that heard what I said and believed it are those who are called of God. Abraham was called. In Jesus, in that same passage in John 10, those Pharisees didn't believe him. He told them this. He says, I told you. I told you who I am. I told you what I came to do. I preached to you the gospel. And not only that, I showed you miracles. I showed you signs and wonders uh, to prove who I am. And you believe not. Why? Because you are not of my sheep. You are not of my sheep. As I said to you. Have you not heard any plainer speech than that? Why will men not believe? Because they're not his sheep. Because God won't call them. If you are Christ and he is your shepherd, I know this. When you're called, you'll do the same thing Abraham did. What did Abraham do? He obeyed. Now what the text says? said that by faith Abraham when he was called what did he do obeyed true faith always comes with obedience you that are called to Christ as a shepherd you not only know him mentally or academically but you know him intimately you who know Christ will not be duped by another Christ you who follow Christ you follow Christ in obedience to the gospel. Here's what separates true professors from false professors. Obedience. Obedience. What is this to obey the gospel? To obey our gospel is nothing less than to believe. That's what obedience is. Obedience is, didn't I just preach that? Whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. How are you going to call on him and who have you not heard? 
How shall you hear without a preacher? And how shall you preach except they be sent? As it is written, how beautiful are the feet of them that preach the gospel of peace and bring glad tidings of good things. So then faith cometh by hearing and hearing by the word of God. Faith cometh by hearing. Not just outward hearing, inward hearing of the call of God. Being taught of God that Christ is all, Christ is all, and you come. You come. I like this. Paul said, knowing your election. Now that's something, isn't it? Pastor, I know the elect will be saved. I know that. Yeah, but are you one of them? Well, how do you know? Paul said, knowing your election of God. Well, how did they know? Knowing your election of God. For our gospel came not in word only, but in power and the Holy Ghost and in much assurance. This call always comes with power. It comes with power. You see, you can't obey the gospel until there's power. And when there's power, there's ability. Isn't that right? If you laid a corpse and life came into the corpse, then there would be ability. Thy people shall be willing. When? In the day of thy power, they shall be willing and obedient to come to Christ. Paul says of these elect, uh, Peter says of the elect, he said, the elect according to the foreknowledge of God through sanctification of the Spirit unto what? Obedience and sprinkling of the blood of Christ. True faith always moves the sinner to Christ. To you who obey, was Christ an option? Or was he a necessity? See, I know the answer to that. I must have Christ or I die. Not an option. Not an option. Those who are called to Christ flee to Christ and forsake everything else. That's what it is to obey to Christ. It is absolute, free, and complete surrender to Christ and Christ alone. That's what it is. Obedience. Is this your faith? Is this your faith? Then listen, you have the same promise Abraham had. You have the same promise. For we have this hope of Abraham... Even the imputed righteousness of Christ that is given to everyone that believes. All who are called and obey the gospel receive with Abraham the same blessings and benefits of Abraham. And so now let's move on in our text. Now verse 9. By faith he sojourned in the land of promise. Now the apostle, after giving us the example or illustration of Abraham's faith, he is now going to give us a very practical view of Abraham's faith. A very practical thing concerning true faith. By faith, Abraham sojourned. Now having been called of God by faith, obeying the gospel, now we see how he walked in this world. How he walked. We see in these few words his rule of life. His rule of life. How did Abraham sojourn? What does your text say? By faith he sojourned. In the land of promise. By faith. The apostle then in the book of Galatians, Galatians testifies to us that Abraham is the father of all believers. The father of all believers. 
seeing he is the prime example of how the true believer is to live in this world, he sets him in opposition to the rule of law as a guide for life. You remember that was the controversy in the church of Galatia. The controversy was that men should believe in Christ and then after believing should go back to the law as a rule, as a rule of life. They should begin in the spirit but finish by obedience in the flesh. And the apostle uses Abraham as a prime example, as an opposition to that uh, point of view. Go to Galatians chapter 3. Galatians chapter 3, verse 1. The apostle says, O foolish Galatians, who hath bewitched you, that you should not obey the truth, before whose eyes Jesus Christ had been evidently set forth crucified among you? This only would I learn of you. Received you the Spirit by the works of the law or by the hearing of faith? How did... We've just been over that. How did you receive? How did you receive this Spirit? Was it through the law or faith? Are you so foolish to begin in the Spirit? Are you now made perfect by the flesh? And what he means by the flesh is the law. Remember the point that the contention was circumcision. That's the point of the law they wanted to keep. And he said, now are you made perfect by circumcision? Are you made perfect by obeying that, that law? Have you suffered so many things in vain, if yet it be in vain? In other words, Paul's calling into question their very faith. He says, I'm calling into question, if you believe that, then you're lost. Everything you've suffered has been in vain, if that's what you believe. He therefore that ministereth unto you, ministereth to you the Spirit, and worketh miracles among you, doeth he by the works of the law, or by the hearing of faith. Listen, even as Abraham believed God, it was accounted to him for righteousness. Know ye therefore that they which are of faith, the same are the children of Abraham. And the scripture foreseeing that God would justify the heathen through faith, preached before the gospel unto Abraham, saying, In these shall all the nations of the earth be blessed. So then they which be of faith are blessed with faithful Abraham. You see now that Abraham is the example, the rule of life. He's saying, look, Abraham is the example. He's not only the example of how a sinner is called to life and faith, but he's also an example of how we're to live in this world. Not by law, but how? By faith. By faith. Now all who would be brought back from faith to law, Paul says, you need to listen to the law. You need to listen to it. If that's the rule of life that a man sojourns by in this world, you've not heard the law. Paul says in the, uh, verse 10 then, he says, Cursed, for as many as are under the works of the law are under the curse of the law. As it is written, Cursed is everyone that continueth not in all things written in the book of the law to do them. But that no man is justified by the law in the sight of God, that's evident. That's evident. For the just shall live, how? By faith. By faith. So then, how did Abraham live? If Abraham is the father of the faithful, if Abraham is the example by which that believers follow in his footsteps, how then did he live? Scripture says he sojourned by faith. By faith. Now, I'll tell you this, it cannot be of both. It cannot be of both. You cannot live by law and faith. You can't. Why? Paul just tells us that in verse 12. And the law is not of faith. Now, I love when Scripture is plain, and it's always plain. Men can throw their objections to it, but that's just so. 
Just as grace and works cannot mix, I tell you this, faith and law cannot mix. Not the same. If it is law, it is not a faith. It's not a faith. The law is not a faith. A man that doeth them shall live in them. Shall live in them. And all who live in them, what is that? Cursed is everyone that continueth not in all things. And this is where men start throwing in their objections. They say, well, I don't mean all the law. I just mean certain parts of the law. No, can't do that. The law is the law. The Ten Commandments is just as much the law as circumcision and tithing, just as much as the dietary and governmental laws of the Old Testament Scripture. Law is the law and curse is everyone that continues not in all them. But for us, but for us who believe, as we sojourn in this life, this is our rule. This is our rule of life that our Savior was made a curse for us. What he tells us, Christ hath redeemed us from the curse of the law by being made a curse. As is written, curses everyone that hangeth upon a tree. For what purpose did he do this? that we should receive the blessing of Abraham. That says in verse 14, that the blessing of Abraham might come on the Gentiles through Christ, that we might receive the promise of the Spirit through faith. Through faith. So when Abraham sojourned, was that before or after the law? Paul says it was 430 years before the law was ever written. He sojourned by faith. Every day, every day Abraham walked upon the face of this earth. You listen how he walked. He walked by faith. He walked looking forward to the coming of the seed by which all the nations of the earth should be blessed. Jesus said that. Abraham rejoiced to see my day and saw it and was glad. Even so then it is with us who are blessed with faithful Abraham. For behold, salvation was never by any measure to come up by the law. Paul says, if it were possible that the salvation should come by law, then it should have. But what does the Scripture conclude? The Scripture concludes all under sin. Impossible to save us by law. We are all under sin. We are all guilty. That the promise by faith of Christ might be given to them that Believe. Isn't that exactly what he tells us in Romans 3? Exactly. He said, Therefore by the deeds of the law shall no flesh be justified in his sight. And what's then the remedy? Christ came and by his faith obtained the righteousness of God and imputes that righteousness, imparts that righteousness to who? Everyone that believeth. That believeth. Therefore rejoice, all you who sojourn in this barren world. This land is filled with troubles, it's filled with pains, it's filled with sorrows. This land grieves us. It cuts us to the quick. And yet you have great cause to rejoice. If you live by faith, you have great cause to rejoice. Rejoice for Christ is the end of the law. For what? For righteousness. To who? Everyone that believeth. Now you get that? That's not a one-time thing, is it? When you believed, was that a one-time check it off your bucket list? And move on. You bet it's not. Faith is always present tense. It's 
always now. Faith never looks back or looks forward. It looks to Christ now. And so in the very teeth of your trouble, you can sojourn. You can endure. How the just shall live by faith. And those who live by faith receive the blessing of faithful Abraham. Blessing of faithful Abraham. The promise of, that was given to him is now given to us. And this faith that we live by, we know this, we don't have faith in our faith. We have faith in the object of our faith. Abraham looked for a city whose builder and maker was God. How long did he look for that? Every day of his life he looked for it. Every day of his life he anticipated it. Looking forward in faith. And secondly, he sojourned as a stranger. <laughs> That's something. Look at your text again. He sojourned by faith, and he sojourned in the land of promise as in a strange country. And when we were lost, the world was not strange. It was natural. You have, how many times have you ever heard that? That's just natural. That's just natural. If it's natural, it's sinful most likely. <laughs> it's just natural. What comes naturally to us is sin. And anybody that's opposed to sin is strange. Strange, peculiar. Something's wrong with that person. He's not natural. You can bet that Abraham was a strange fellow. To those people he walked among, he was a stranger. When we walked according to the course of this world, we were not strange. We were just like all of Adam's race. The scripture says we were dead in trespasses and sin. We walked according to the course of this world, according to the prince of the power of the air, the spirit that now worketh in the children of disobedience. We all had our conversation in time. The world wasn't strange. Until when? Until God gave us a new nature. Then everything became strange to us and everyone thought we were strange. Strangers. Strangers. As we sojourn in this life, when we flee to Christ, we fled to Him for refuge and we forsook all things. Let the wicked forsake his thoughts. Let the unrighteous man forsake his, his ways and let it return unto the Lord. Isn't that what we did when we came to Christ? We forsook it all. We leave it all. We abandon our religion. We abandon our self-righteousness. We abandon everyone that opposes Christ. We come to Christ and Christ alone. We are strangers because of it. And the more we grow in grace, the more we walk by faith, the more vain this world becomes. The more empty, the more hollow. The more we grow in grace, the more we see the vileness of this old nature that is wrapped around us like a rotting corpse. We struggle, we loathe. Isn't that what the part of the covenant in Ezekiel chapter 36? You shall loathe yourself. Now tell me, is that, is that a, a strange thing to people? You go about loathing yourself and they say, well, you just need a little self-esteem. No, I need Christ. In Him I'm perfect. In Him I have everything. In myself, I have nothing. Then you have this warfare. You have this constant struggle inside of you. The things you would do. You would be holy. You would be righteous. You want to be like Christ. And the flesh pulls you to the earth. It drags you in the mud. You say, oh, wretched man that I am, who shall deliver me from the body of this death? And yet the word of God tells me I am as righteous as God's son. Talk about a strange fellow. You're a strange fellow, believer. You're a stranger. And the world won't understand you. Abraham walked in the land of promise and didn't own a thing. He never bought a piece of ground until his wife died, had to buy that cave to bury her in. He didn't own one plot of land, yet it was all his. Isn't that the same with you? 
Believer, you have nothing and yet you own everything. You're a strange fellow. I am an heir to all things. Go where you will in this world, it's mine. I don't own it in the flesh, but I tell you I own it in Christ. It's mine. I own it all. I do. Where's your title? Here it is. How do you know? By faith. By faith. I sojourn by faith. I sojourn by faith. And because of this, we are strange people. And not only this, Abraham dwelt. No, this is the last thing. I want you to see this. Abraham dwelt, dwelling in tabernacles with Isaac and Jacob, heirs of the same promise. Heirs of the same promise. Now, Abraham, these, these men dwelt in his loins. We know that. And he didn't, before he had Isaac, he, he only saw this by faith. But there was a day that came and Isaac was born. And he dwelt with Isaac, his son. He saw what God had promised. And listen to this. He also saw Jacob. You know that? Jacob was 15 years old by the time I, Abraham died. He actually dwelt in tents with them. Isn't this what we're doing right now? Dwelling together in tents. I tell you what, every time I see one of God's people come in, it encourages me. Just as much as Isaac encouraged Abraham. Because he knew that through that man Christ should come. I tell you this, I am encouraged when God brings His people in. And though we don't see them now, listen, He will bring them in so that we could dwell together. Believer, we dwell together in these mortal frames and we, by our sojourning, by sojourning by faith, we encourage one another. Your sojourning by faith encourages me to sojourn by faith. Encourages me. Forsake not the assembling of yourselves together as a manner of some is. For the encouragement of the saints. To edify, to stir one another up to love. Provoke me to love. And that's what we do. So as we sojourn, we sojourn by faith. We sojourn as strangers. And we sojourn together. Just like Abraham. I pray that God bless this to you. And stand be dismissed in prayer.